What's cooking everybody? It's Monday, September 28th. It's officially fall and this is the Poor Couples Food Guy Deep Dish Podcast where we do a deep dive on all your favorite foods. I'm your host, Poor Couples Food Guy, Eric, aka The Goose, aka Forest Wanderer. And with me as always is my lovely co-host, Poor Couples Food Guy, Meg, aka Lay Skunk, aka Baroque Girl. Hello. And together we are running late as always. But we hope you'll forgive us and you're hungry for some tasty knowledge tracks because today your main course is going to be some burritos. Yeah, let's get started with this week's appetizers. So uh, for starters, we didn't mention this in last week's episode, but for our video watchers, we uh, have some netting back here for um, about a week ago we released... 25 live beetles into our apartment <laughs> that's a sentence they're good beetles though they're they like, are they're related to ladybugs yeah they're a type of ladybug basically they're cool like halloween ladybugs because they're like black and orange they got like an orange head or something they would help take care of the mealy bug and scale problem we have that's been going on for too long yeah so like anyone that knows us or anyone who's watching on youtube can see we have a fucking forest growing back here and um we you know with with plants and house plants comes pests, pests. yeah and uh yeah so you they're know they're also just already like extra pets at this point yeah that too yeah, we're already excited on them. we're just about this around. close from naming them all 25 of them like but uh, yeah, so we'll see how they go. They're good guys. Like I said, they're, they're just little ladybugs. They're yeah. cool Halloween ladybugs. So we'll see how they take care of our uh, mealy bug problem. Now, I still need to leave a review for the place because they all came alive. So like, oh uh, yeah, that's true. That good. Yeah, so good for them. We, we got them on Amazon, right? Yeah. There's a lot of things you can buy on Amazon. <laughs> you can buy swords and other weapons. You can buy like cinnamon toast crunch from Plant Pantry. You can get just live bugs, <laughs> live insects. So... Uh, yeah, we wanted to talk also not just about bugs. We also wanted to talk about, like, just, like, stupid, weird quirks that we did, like, eating, like, food as children. Because I feel like we've touched on that before in, like, past episodes. But as I was writing this episode up and, like, reading stuff about, like, burritos and tacos and stuff, I remember, like, it got me thinking about, as a kid, I was a picky eater, and one of the stupidest things that I ever did was for taco night, back when my family did taco night, before it turned into Taco Tuesday and a big <laughs> thing, but um, what I would do was I would take just the plain, like, crunchy taco, like, corn tortilla, and I would put nothing into it because I was a stupid little shit, <laughs> and instead, I would take that corn tortilla shell, and I would take a single slice of American cheese, insert it in there, and just like that was that was my taco that's how i ate tacos as a little kid because i'm an idiot i feel like you had more like weird like kid food quirks than i did because you were pickier eater as a kid than i was a little Although i feel like the rules are a little reversed now i'm like slightly more pickier than you yeah yeah but, like to an extent um but yeah like the main thing i did as a kid that was dumb was like pizza related which is sad now because pizza is like my favorite food but <laughs> like for pepperoni pizza i would take off all the pepperonis put them to the side eat the pizza and then eat the pepperoni separate <laughs> and my parents would be like well, why'd you get pepperoni pizza then it's like i still want the pepperoni like mm, kid brain yeah and then i also went through a phase where i would just peel the cheese off eat the cheese separate and then just eat like saucy bread slice <laughs> I mean, I, I can. Know. You ate the cheese afterwards, though, right? I ate the cheese first. Oh well, yeah. So yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can top that because I, as a stupid kid, would take pizza, do the same thing, peel the cheese layer off of the crust, and just throw it away, or I would give it to my parents or something, and I would just like, I, like you said, like I would just eat the saucy, saucy bread slice. That doesn't even make sense. Like, uh, I don't, I don't know. know. Why'd we do it? I don't know. I think because as a kid, I just kind of saw like, ooh, it's like gooey and greasy look. I mean, to this very day, I am still finicky with pizza. I love pizza like a fucking child, but uh, like I do still pat it down. I, I don't like the grease on it. Mm -hmm. Like if it's a very greasy pizza, I will go through three paper towels and napkins to like get all that fucking oil off the top of it. To be fair... To be fair, as I mentioned in a previous episode, I do suffer from, like, chronic GERD and gastritis and shit. And, yeah, you know, uh, my family has a history of gallbladder problems. So, pools of oil and grease, not the best to be putting into my fucking GI tract. So, yeah. 
Now that I think about it, I feel like my rationale might have been because, like, for anything like pizza, like baked ziti, anything where it's like a melted cheese layer and then tomato sauce underneath, the cheese is just like, like it just holds in all the heat. So I feel like I started mm-hmm. doing it to like take the cheese off to like cool off the rest of the pizza. But then I didn't want to wait, so I would just eat the cheese and then eat the other one separate. I feel like it might have been a temperature thing. Yeah, that could be it. Because I wouldn't do it with cold pizza. Cold pizza, I would just eat as is. It was only like fresh hot pizza, which is even more tragic. But Yeah, that is weird. Um, I mentioned in another episode, I think, what I would do with Twix bars was I would like take the Twix out and then I would bite off the top layer of caramel so i was just left with a stupid cookie and then eat the cookie afterwards i mean even now like reese's peanut butter cups the little ones i'll like bite off the bottom which is just like the thin layer of chocolate and the peanut butter and eat that and eat like the more solid layer of chocolate last so it continues into adulthood i guess yeah i also i don't even know if this counts as like stupid or like weird because I feel like a lot of people do it. But, like, if I'm eating, like, tube macaronis, I will put, like, one tube on each, like, prong of the fork. I will. Yeah, I still yeah. do that. Just because it's funny. It's like you're just, <laughs> you're, you're gloving up the, the fork. You're yeah. making sure it's got little like, I don't, noodle like, fingers. Like, trying to stab a tube. Like, no, you just slide it in there. It's barbaric. It Come is. on, man. <laughs> That's the only things I can think of right now. I'm sure there was other stupid things I did. I think as a kid, I also, what I did was when we had chicken cutlets... I would sometimes cut off, like, the edges of the chicken cutlet because I thought that that was where, like, the fat was. Oh. Even though it's a chicken breast, it has no fat on it. So, uh Oh, one thing I did that wasn't, like, stupid, was actually brilliant as a kid, was one time I took all the cookie dough blobs out of cookie dough ice cream and mushed them together into, like, little cookies and baked them in the toaster oven. <laughs> So I had ice cream and cookies. Bonus cookie. Yeah. Instead of just going to the cupboard and getting a cookie. <laughs> I don't know. It was fun. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, did it work? You got yeah, a cookie. Yeah, it worked. I'm surprised if like you like know, it wasn't like the best chocolate chip cookie yeah. in the world, but it worked. Like for like a seven year old or however old I was, like it impressed me. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I guess so like you're a kid, you don't know where cookie dough comes from. You just, your your mother like yeah. makes a, a machine with loud noise <laughs> happens, and then you just get cookie dough after. So all right. Uh, anyway, we've got a long episode ahead of us. So without further ado, I present to you today's main course. <laughs> Burritos are little slice of heaven rolled up into blissful perfection. In modern times, if your area doesn't have a nice little burrito grill less than like 15 minutes away, then your life is shit. We all love burritos. Whether we're talking a gigantic grilled masterpiece from the local Mexican grill to smaller crafted burritos at an upscale restaurant to your cheap chintzy dollar burritos at Taco Bell, they're all awesome. And best of all, burritos are one of the few cool party mascot foods out there that appeal to both omnivores and vegetarians. But not vegans, because they hate happiness. So, what formally constitutes a burrito, anyway? Well, in their simplest form, a burrito is basically just, I don't know, it's a dish comprised of food wrapped up in a flour tortilla. And traditionally, you know, you almost always guaranteed to find rice, beans, and cheese, and probably some sort of meat inside. But that said... Burritos are ripe for experimentation, and the sky is the limit when it comes to finding cool new shit to cram inside your tortilla wrap. The word burrito translates to little donkey in Spanish, with burro being the word for donkey and ito being a fun suffix for small or cutesy things. So for example, a perro is a dog, but a perrito is a doggy or puppy. Another fine example is the frito bandito. Just calling him the frito bandit, mm, I don't know, that's kind of intimidating. Like... The guy's here to steal all your corn chips, and but he's, he's packing heat, too. He's got guns, like literal guns. But, you know, they need to make it bandito so that he's cute and fun. And, you know, albeit a super offensive ethnic character, but, yeah, he's cute and fun, and he was voiced by Mel Blanc, who, the voice of Bugs Bunny, if you were, like, seven years old listening to this. But, like, really, imagine if instead of the Frito Bandito, he was just the Frito Bandit. Like, he's just, like, this buff, burly, intimidating outlaw dude who... He, 
just shows up at your house with like a gun in each hand. He's just like, listen, Aso, don't try anything funny. I'm gonna free the bandit. Now hand over your salty snacks pronto. If you so much as try to take a move, I won't think twice to pull the trigger and send you straight into the cielo. Comprende, gringo? Ooh, holy shit. I'd be scared. Give me chills. Uh, but instead he was just like, I'm here for your free throw. Because like, he, he was basically just Speedy Gonzalez's voice. Because like, it was Mel Blanc doing him. So... He still uh, can't have my Fritos. Yeah, that too. He he also can't exist anymore because, like well, I said, yeah. just very, very, like, just offensive character. Um, in terms of burritos, though, it's theorized that the name burrito references the fact that much like the trusty, reliable donkey, which are known for carrying little rolled up bundles of goods, burritos could also hold a ton of weight despite their small size. But, you know, instead of hauling, like, clothing and pottery and tools and farm equipment like burros were... Burritos would instead hold, you know, mass quantities of shredded chicken and queso sauce. I don't know. We've had some burritos so big, it's definitely possible there might have been some clothes inside them. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting to point out, however, though, like, uh, burritos that we know today are, they're very different to how they traditionally started. We're, like, we're used to these, like, glorious, oversized rolls filled with, like, a mountain of rice and exquisite meats and, like, three different salsas and guacamole and every cheese ever known to man. But, like, burritos, they just began as, like, a humble, rustic, like, portable dish, which didn't really change much until they hit it big here in the States fairly recently. Uh, in the U.S., particularly like our healthy latino population particularly of mexican immigrants has permanently infused our culture with theirs so you know as such it's it's pretty uncommon for most urban and suburban areas here to not have at least you know one or two like good hole-in-the-wall burrito places especially like places on the coast and in the southwest places like florida new york california and so on like we're we're really lucky we've got a lot of latino communities here and as such you can't really go more than a few miles without driving past a good old Mexican grill. And that's not including the dozens of restaurant chains we see throughout America, which help to pad out the, you know, good ones. Ones you'd actually want to go to, as opposed to Taco Bell or Chipotle. So I actually have a confession to make. Well, you're aware of it. But to our audience, I once was a total Taco Bell addict. Like, I was one of those assholes sitting at the drive-thru at Taco Bell at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday night. And me and my friends weren't even, like, potheads or anything. We were just schlubs. Really, really hungry, poor schlubs. It's okay. We all have some skeletons in our closets. As long as you recognize and have learned from your mistakes. Also, to be fair, like, I think a big part of it was just, like, how ludicrously cheap Taco Bell tends to be. Like, to this day... Even though I rarely get it anymore, I will say there is something really special about walking into a place, ordering six burritos and a quesadilla, and only owing the cashier like three seventy five or something. So, like as a college student working super part time, like that, you know, is a pretty attractive prospect. It is really hard to beat cheap when you're not rolling in the dough or tortillas. Oh, also, I have another confession to make. Well. You're aware of it, but to our audience here, and that's that I absolutely fucking despise Chipotle from the depths of my soul. <laughs> Actually, that's not much of a confession. Chipotle's bullshit. Uh, we're going to get into that much, much later in the podcast, though, so wait for that later on. Anyway, for better or worse, a lot of these chains and franchise restaurants are uh, they are pretty responsible for developing some of the more modern qualities that we see with burritos, mostly for the better. Uh, I say that because, well, to be frank, um, traditional burritos, like, probably sucked. Modern day, uh, modern day burritos, like, you know, they're just, like, they're an international treasure. I wouldn't trade them for anything. Well, except maybe for, like, eternal life and a, and a gold-plated television, but, hey, let's, let's not get our hopes up too much. As such, this episode is gonna have some, uh, junk in the trunk. It's definitely gonna be backloaded, considering that there's a lot of history to cover with burritos over the last half century or so. So then, you know, now that we know exactly what burritos tend to be, um, I mean, let's be real. Everybody fucking knows what burritos are, so let's not pretend that anyone needed that introduction. But we couldn't just skip over our, our, our overview section, so we stretch it out as best we could. So, because of that, let's start digging into their origin story. So while there's many types of burritos and many different ways to prepare a burrito, no matter how you want to slice it, the absolute one common ground and one main ingredient for all of them is the tortilla. 
Well, unless we're talking about burrito bowls, but burrito bowls aren't really burritos. Although, even then, a lot of burrito bowls still have the tortilla in the bottom, so... Eh. <laughs> Tortillas have long been a staple food for much of Central and South America, dating back to ancient Mesoamerican civilizations. While today we've come to associate burritos with soft flour tortillas, back in the olden days of Mexico and other countries, people were actually using corn tortillas instead. Yeah, I feel like there might actually be a decent chance some listeners have never actually had a corn tortilla before. Like, I mean, it depends on where they're from. But in general, I feel like they're a lot less common in America and other non-Latino nations today. Uh, a corn tortilla, like it's the same concept as a flour tortilla. It's a thin, round, little flatbread. Uh, except the corn version, it's like it's made from cornmeal and stuff. So it's a lot drier. It's a lot rougher. It's not as moist. They're still thin and they're pliable, but whereas flour tortillas are soft and moist, corn tortillas are, they're a little closer in texture to a, um, you know, it's actually hard to describe it. Uh, they're a little grainier, I guess. And I don't mean grainy like powdery. I mean, literally grainy, like multi-grain, like grains. Uh, think of it this way. Like, you know how cornbread is a little bit more crumbly than regular wheat bread? Well, it's the same thing with corn tortillas. I don't know. I think... Most people probably have had corn tortillas, like not fresh, soft ones, but like every taco kit in the country comes with the hard corn taco shells. Okay, that's fair. I wasn't thinking of like the the corn shells. Before you fry them into a crunchy taco, like I'm talking about the soft ones, and those are probably like very unknown outside of... I don't think I ever had one before we went to the Mexican grill. Yeah, I I don't know if I ever did either, but like that's, that's your traditional like tortilla for using like uh like tacos and stuff and not your old el paso yeah. taco kits but like actual tacos like street tacos and shit um yeah incidentally because of that corn tortillas the, the soft one they they do tend to be a little less appetizing around their own they really need some sort of juicy meat or veggies or sauce or something to make them more palatable or you can fry them into tortilla chips right Actually, fun fact, you can pretty easily create your own tortilla chips at home by buying plain corn tortillas at the store, cutting them into quarters, and frying them in a pan of oil. Seriously, give it a try. It's really easy. They're like 10 million percent better than just your plain old bag of store-bought chips. Man, deep frying is such a good way to improve so many foods. Like, zucchini, kind of watery, tastes a little like a wet sponge. Bam! Deep fry it, and it's a nice, healthier alternative to french fry. Pork loin mm, tends to be, you know, kind of dry and lacking flavor. Bam! Fry it up as a cutlet, and now you get a nice, crunchy Wiener schnitzel. Unskippable YouTube ads get in the way of your videos, and they're never interesting. Bam! Defry them, and you got a busted cell phone. Uh, but it's a broken phone instead of a delicious, crunchy coating that you can eat. Ooh, and uh, bonus points, your phone will at least be nice and sterile after sitting in 400 degree oil for a minute or two, so yay! <laughs> 2020 solutions. Anyway, corn tortillas have been around forever. Civilizations like the Aztecs have been growing corn since literal prehistory. Like, really, there's archaeological evidence that suggests that, like, Mexico first started growing the earliest cultivars of corn or maize it's over 9,000 years ago. Side note here, I'm so happy we finally covered a topic that let us make an over 9,000 reference. <laughs> These early varieties of corn actually kind of sucked, though. The cobs were only an inch or two long, and each plant only grew one cob. So, in other words, shittiest corn on the cob ever. <laughs> you take, like, one bite, and oh, it's gone. Or, on the other hand, consider this. What if, instead of thinking you take one bite and it's gone, rather, what if you just see as a bunch of tiny little corn on the cobs, you just pop in your mouth and eat, like, potato chips? Whoa. <laughs> Man, imagine that. Oh, man. I mean, it's kind of like the baby corns. Hmm, but baby corns kind of suck too, unless they're stir fried. I don't know. We'll never know. Yeah. That is for the ages. <laughs> uh, yeah, corn on the topic of corn, it actually has this like really ridiculous, complicated history about how it was crossbred with like other related grass species. And oh, yeah, by the way, corn is a member of the grass family. I never knew that, but um, makes sense because it goes straight up like bamboo. But we don't really want to get into that since it'd take a long time and like all the sources we saw covering it made it seem like this really difficult, like intimidating thing to like learn about. Corn apparently is just like serious fucking business, people. Either way, over centuries of crossbreeding, it slowly got closer and closer to what we have today. And corn turned into one of the most important cereal crops in the entire world. And side note, yeah, it's actually called a cereal crop. <laughs> This is fun. I never really knew about this. But yeah, like, 
uh, the exact definition of a cereal is basically just any type of edible grain that's picked from a grass crop. So stuff like corn, oats, rice, and wheat, they're all considered cereal. Like, wait a second. Corn, oats, rice, wheat. Those are like, those are where all the like breakfast cereals we know are made of. Hence the term cereal. <laughs> like cereals at the store, Cheerios and Checks and Lucky Charms and shit. It all makes sense now. It's cereal, cereal. That's why it's called cereal. I never realized that. Oh man, but like actually, as neat as it is, um, I gotta say, cereal crop sounds way cooler and more fun than it actually ever could be. Like in reality, it's just a big field of wheat and like you know grass and shit. Uh, you know, it's like like oats and rice. Like you gotta like process that shit before you can cook it first. Uh, that's kind of lame. What I want is I want a cereal crop where, like, you peel back the leaves and there's just, like, bundles of Cap'n Crunch inside of them. That would be awesome. Like, you open the, like, you peel back, like, the corn husk and instead of, like, the kernels. Just yeah, little Cap'n, Cap'n Crunch. Crunch. <laughs> Crunchitize me, Cap'n. <laughs> and by that, I mean I'm putting you on the barbecue because, oh, man, imagine grilled Cap'n Crunch corn on the cob. <sighs> oh, we forgot to put the Cap'n on the table. Ah, uh, well. Okay. There he is. <laughs> There we go. There's our Cap'n Crunch amiibo. <laughs> Not really an amiibo. It just looks like an amiibo. <laughs> anyway, speaking of hard and inedible, in terms of tortillas, these corns are basically just what we today describe as an Indian corn. Before you could do anything with them, you needed to process them first. Or, well, I guess I should say before you could do anything food-related with them, because you could probably use them to beat someone. Those things were hard. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, the main process used for transforming hard corn kernels from small yellow rocks into, you know, actual food is called nixtamalization. Tongue twister, nixtamalization. Uh, nixtamalization is basically, you take corn kernels, you soak them in like a strong alkaline solution like lime water or our old friend pot ash, which you might remember from the Irish soda bread episode. This process is really cool because it basically softens up the kernels a bit by loosening them from the outer hull walls, and it even kills off some types of bacteria and fungi which might normally make you sick if you ate them. It's really high-tech shit for a process that's been around since before the Roman Empire. Yeah, like, I don't know, the overview description we picked for it is, um, well, I'm just going to give you the play-by-play that I found on uh, Wikipedia. <clears throat> Lime and ash are highly alkaline. The alkalinity helps the dissolution of hemocellulose, the major glue-like component of maize cellular walls, and loosens the hulls from the kernels to soften the maize. Some of the corn oil is broken down into emulsifying agents like monoglycerides and diglycerides, while bonding of the maize proteins to each other is also facilitated. The divalent calcium in lime acts as a cross-linking agent for protein and polysaccharide acidic side chains. My brain hurts. <laughs> what the freak do they even mean? I think that was all just like chemistry talk for like, the chemicals make the corn really soft. Uh, it's really interesting though, because like it's just another case of like, how the hell do these ancient people figure this out? Like, we're two fairly intelligent people with college educations and an extensive background in cooking and food, and we can't really figure that out. So like, what do they have like, ancient Aztec scientists like working their asses off on it? Like, Greetings, Grand Chemist Jeep Cha. How goes the experimentation? Well, after extensive clinical studies against numerous placebos, we found that this solution utilizing limestone and charcoal ashes results in softer maize, which is easier to process. It can easily be milled and cooked afterwards, and it tastes better. Ah, excellent, most impressive. Very promising results and wonderful work. Oh, how about the human sacrifice trials? Have you discovered how many people we must disembowel with a golden sword to prevent the sun from setting? Mm, not quite yet. Uh, we, uh, we're really not sure if there's uh, much of a connection between the human sacrifice. Well, keep at it. Start slaughtering virgins next. Ooh, and maybe a few babies too while you're at it. Couldn't hurt. <laughs> Actually, like, interestingly, I think on Good Eat, um, Alan Brown mentioned that because like you need to use the nixtamalization process to make the corn edible like um the people who came over from europe to 
South American countries, they just brought corn back to Europe without learning the process. <laughs> so they just like tried to eat it and they got sick from it because they had like no Broke nutrition. <laughs> yeah, well, even not even that. They just like were eating it, but it had no nutritional value because it wasn't like prepared properly and they all got womp, sick. Womp, womp. Well, I guess um, I guess that was the real Montezuma's revenge then. Because yeah. like, I don't know, probably took them a while to figure that out. And like all the like Mesoamerican peoples were like, ha, 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 you dumbasses. <laughs> Yeah, so, like, if you're going to steal people's culture, at least, like, learn how to do it properly. Yeah, that's actually a very poignant point to, like, make about <laughs> today's, like, culture and shit. So, oh, yeah. Either Anyway, nixtamalization has been used for millennia, and to this day, it's still the best way to prepare hard kernel corn for processing. Once these ancient peoples found ways to mill their maize, all bets were off. Corn became a way of life for them, and with the rise of corn as a staple crop, tortillas followed shortly after. And by shortly after, we mean really shortly after, because there's evidence suggesting tortillas were first invented close to 10,000 years ago. Holy shit. Can I just say for a moment, I am really glad that we are, like, talking about food history that isn't just about the (laughs) Industrial Revolution for once. Like, we had a run of, like, six episodes in a row that were just, the Industrial Revolution happened, and then some guy invented this food around 1900. The end. Last week, we had a nice change-up with chicken tikka masala being invented, like, you know, about 50 years ago. And now we're on the polar opposite of the spectrum, with the origin of the burrito stretching back to literal prehistory. So, good call past <laughs> us for suggesting burritos as a topic. Um, But yeah, so I know this sounds pretty wide open, but hell, when you discovered a food you like, it's hard to stop eating it. And for the entirety of Mesoamerica, that meant latching onto early versions of tacos and burrito wraps and stuff for like 10,000 frigging years. Seriously, think about how long that is. We live in the year 2020, and like we need to be around for like another 8,000 years to make it to the year 10,000 AD. So like the time that's passed since Jesus Christ did his whole deal, we need to go through that four more times. Like holy ass. That is a long time. Do you think any of our stupid foods that we have today will make it to 10,000 AD? <laughs> I mean, if tortilla wraps have been around for that long, then hell, burritos could probably survive that long too. Maybe hamburgers as well. Like, they're pretty simple and everybody loves them. But something tells me, though, that uh, like $52 deconstructed Eggs Benedict <laughs> uh, probably is not going to stick around for very long. So, sorry, molecular gastronomists. <laughs> Anyway, we've spent enough time in prehistory, so let's get nitty and let's get gritty, and we're going to move forward a few thousand years to take a look at the history and development of burritos. So, this entire time, we've been talking about corn tortillas specifically, but as we've mentioned, corn tortillas are a bit rougher and stiffer than flour tortillas that we use for uh, burritos today in modern times. You can thank the Spanish for that, who introduced wheat flour to the New World. With this, the natives began making flour tortillas and realized, holy shit, these are way better than our crappy corn tortillas for making tacos. Yeah, so we covered a lot of this in our episode about flan, but in the 1500s, during the age of conquistadors, the Spanish brought with them, you know, a whole slew of new foods and cooking ideas and other neat stuff, which they introduced the indigenous people living in Central and South America. They also, you know, raped them and wiped out their entire civilization, too. But, you know, you gotta crack a few eggs. You want to make a burrito, am I right? (laughs) I mean, if it's a breakfast burrito, you actually would need to break a few eggs. Touche. Um, So for what remained of Mesoamerica in the Conquistadors' wakes, the countries which which stuck around and they retained their love for rolling up foods and tasty flatbreads, you know, even after their, like, ancestors were gone... But now they had these, like, tasty new flour versions, which were a lot easier to work with. They were quickly adopted into Mexican and other South American cuisine over the next few centuries, but the concept of, like, a fully wrapped smorgasbord burrito didn't really happen until well, closer to the 1900s. Uh, before that, it was, you know, it's pretty common for indigenous people to create, like, tortilla wraps using avocados, peppers, mushrooms, squash, and tomatoes. So... Not bad, not bad, considering some of, like, the early tacos that we read about uh, from Central America were mostly just, like, small fish that people caught in rivers. Mm, Nothing beats a nice fish taco filled with dozens and dozens of tiny little bones stabbing you in the gums. (laughs) Another account we said, uh, or we read, says that the Pueblo people of the southwest U.S. had a, uh, a, a history of making early burritos where they just, like, wrapped up and sealed mixtures of beans and meats. 
All right, we're getting closer here. You just need some rice and cheese in that thing, and you've got yourself a burrito. Yeah, and then lastly, we also saw a few sources suggesting that early burritos were adopted as uh, a traveling food by Mexican cowboys, also known as vaqueros. Obviously, it's a very portable, road trip friendly food, and, you know, even when said road trip is actually just a day on horseback out on the ranch. But, you know, vaqueros were basically the predecessor to America's adorable little cartoon cowboys, only, you know, they were much cooler because they were eating burritos on horseback in the middle of the desert, instead of pretending to play a 30,000 guitar next to a $70,000 pickup truck uh, while singing a highly auto-tuned song about how they're actually a good old country boy with real country person problems. Modern country music is the worst genre of music. Go ahead, add us. We dare you. Go, go ahead. I'll fight you. Uh, Fun fact, the American word buckaroo, as in, well, howdy there, buckaroo, seems to have come from the word vaqueros. Vaca is Spanish for cow, and ero is basically just a suffix for, like, uh, a dude. So, yeah, it literally just translates to cowboy. Huh. I didn't realize we'd be doing so many Spanish lessons this episode. What can I say? I guess those six years of studying Spanish in grade school are finally paying off. Uh, but really, uh, vaquero, you know, it's pronounced as vaquero, got eventually got corrupted and anglicized as buckaroo. So, like, vaquero, 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 vaquero. So, you know, 200 years later, well, buckle up, buckaroo. <laughs> There's a couple folk stories for the ri- official origin of the burrito, but they all seem to just be, well, folklore, unfortunately, since there's actual documentation for burritos preceding them all. Yeah, so, for example, one of the more popular explanations is that during the Mexican Revolution in 1910, a food vendor named Juan Mendez would travel to different cities on a donkey selling wraps to people in the streets. So, as we discussed earlier, burrito means, you know, little donkey, hence people said that they were purchasing their comida del burrito, or food of the donkey. That said, this story is after the first documented use of burrito as a food, so it's probably just a fun tale and not really concrete. Another origin story contends that there was another popular food vendor in Ciudad, uh, Ciudad Juarez who served food to school children, and uh, he frequently served them tortilla wraps. But, as we all know, little kids are annoying, and they're dumb, so this guy, you know, he got that though, because supposedly he referred to the kids as burritos, you know, burritos, little donkeys, jackasses, dumbasses, dimwits, dipshits, shit for brains, dumb fucks, fuckheads, you know, burritos. Unfortunately, as much as we want one of our favorite foods to have gotten their name as a means to make fun of children, this one seems like hearsay, since it's estimated to have been in the 1940s, which is even later than the last claim. Yeah, going back further, though, the first documented official use of the word burrito was in 1895, and it comes from a book, uh, El Diccionario de Jimecanismos. Basically, it's a Spanish language dictionary used in the context of Mexican culture and lexicon. So, a burrito was defined as una tortilla arrayada con carne u otra cosa dentro que en Yucatan llamada cosito y en Cuernavaca y en México taco. So, uh, I know we don't have a lot of like. Well, I don't. I don't want to say we don't have a lot of Spanish. We don't know if we don't. We don't know that for a fact. I don't speak Spanish though. Tell me what it means. (laughs) I'm going to say we probably don't have a lot of fluent spanish speakers listening to this anyway that just translates to uh wow i lost my place here that's a bad place to lose a place it okay. translates to a rolled tortilla with meat or other ingredients inside called cosito in yucatan and taco in the city of cuernavaca in mexico so in other words ding 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 we finally officially got ourselves a burrito well okay technically we don't have a burrito but we have a definition of a burrito, which, you know, it's just as good. I mean, unless, like, the author of that dictionary was just, like, he invented the word burrito on the spot without them actually existing. And, like, shit, shit, I need one more word for this dictionary. Uh, okay, so, uh, it's a food, and, uh, uh it's one of those tortilla wrap things, and they eat it in Mexico, and, uh, I don't know, it's, it's called a cosito, or a, a tortito. Oh, burrito! That, yeah, that, that's good enough. And then people saw that word, and were just like, oh, yeah, you know what, it's not bad. <laughs> Seriously, it seems despite the cute little origin stories above, burritos had already been around for a while, before 1895, if they made it into a Mexican dictionary. Yeah, it seems like they just sort of developed slowly in the background over the span of, like, basically an entire millennium. Like, their earliest predecessors have been around for thousands of years, and then they just sort of emerged in Mexican culture by the end of the 19th century. 
But that said, these early burritos weren't quite up to what we have today. They were rustic and simple and most likely smaller than what we're used to. So instead, it took an American touch to turn them into the big glorious PVC pipe of food that could easily feed two people. After all, if there's one thing we Americans are good at, it's taking a food and increasing its size and deliciousness by 400%. Enter the Mission Burrito. Mission Burritos, also known as San Francisco Burritos, are named for the Mission District in San Francisco, California, which contained a lot of Mexican immigrants and as such, a high number of taquerias and uh, food grills. Prior to like the large modern burritos that we're accustomed to that being invented over there, the actual like first publication that mentioned burritos in the U.S. was uh, it was a Mexican cookbook that was written by a chick named Erna Ferguson, who was basically like a writer and historian who focused most of her career on Mexican and uh, southwestern like indigenous culture in the U.S. She wrote this cookbook in 1934, and in it was the very first American recipe for a burrito, which was mostly just filled with chicharrones, which are, are a type of pork skin. Presumably, the concept of burritos grew in popularity in the Southwest, since around the same time in the mid-1930s, burritos were showing up on menus at Mexican-themed cafes in California. Yeah, and then uh, a few decades later, the moment that we've all been waiting for finally happened. In 1961, the Mexican-American food store El Faro invented the Mission Burrito by creating a large steamed burrito stuffed with rice, beans, cheese, veggies, guacamole, sour cream, and meats. Rolled up in foil to keep it tight and the world rejoiced. Hell yes, we made it, folks. No longer did you have to deal with a wimpy-ass burrito that you could comfortably eat in one sitting. Nah, screw that. What are you, a pussy? If the circumference of that burrito isn't larger than the size of your mouth, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> this version of burritos quickly took off in popularity in communities throughout California and soon spread to the rest of the Southwest as a regional specialty. Before long, the burrito was a nationwide favorite, and the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, so we may have ourselves the superhero origin story of the burrito now, but obviously the story doesn't stop there, because over the last few decades... People have been doing all sorts of crazy crap with them. So let's get modern and see what sort of wacky ventures they've been in recently. So this episode is all about burritos. And as such, we would absolutely be a couple of knuckleheads if we didn't touch on all the crazy crap that Taco Bell has cranked out over the years. Taco Bell got its start in 1954 in San Bernardino, California, which seems to be a running theme with most burrito development starting in California. But yeah, the name comes from its founder, restaurateur and chef Glenn Bell. Very authentic Latino <laughs> name. Yeah, it began life as Bell's Drive-In in Taco Tia. Yeesh, it's kind of kind of a mouthful. Uh, but as you'll see, this seems to be another running theme with burrito franchises that uh, a lot of them were started by white dudes. Like... Eh, que paso mi eso es un día maravillosamente. Me llamo Glenn Bell y este aquí es mi restaurante nuevo. Se llamo Bell's Drive-In in Taco Tia. Muy bien. <laughs> um, but with menu items that range from like bastardizing traditional cuisine into, you know, incorrect, albeit delicious versions such as chalupas, which aren't actually chalupas and, you know, just random desserts like Dunkin' branded donuts. Um, it doesn't, I, I think it's safe to say that Doc, Taco Bell doesn't really qualify the Mexican food. I don't think they care. Yeah. I mean, that said, ironically, their burritos actually tend to be fairly authentic to both old school burritos and the modern mission style burrito. Yeah. When you get burritos at Mexican restaurants, they tend to be fairly small and like pretty simple. So like just like a little bit of rice, a little bit of shredded meats and some cheese. And, uh, when you order one at Taco Bell, that's actually what you get most, you know, uh, like with. I mean, I've never had, like, I, I mostly get their chicken ones, but, like, yeah, most of their, like, cheap ones are shredded chicken. They're just meat, cheese, and, like, rice. So, um, you know, similarly, their larger, pricier burritos, which, side note, when I say pricey, I mean, like, $4 <laughs> because Taco Bell is the only place on the planet where $5 can be considered extravagant. Anyway, um, besides their little burritos, they also have their large burritos, which are you know, they're frequently the same as, like, mission-style burritos, compete with, like, beans, multiple toppings, and they grill them shut, so good for them. Like, they got one thing right at Taco Bell. Do you think that they, like, 
actually set out to be authentic. Like, okay, guys, we need at least one thing on this menu to actually resemble Mexican food. What should we make it? Or, like, was it just total accident? Like, what if they were trying to reinvent the burrito, some sort of weird, stupid thing? Like, I don't know. It was shaped like an ice cream cone or something. And they just totally fucked it up. And they were really bummed out. Like, ah, come on. Why the frig won't this burrito stay in a cone shape? What if we try cutting in half and serving it like a banana split or something? Ugh, that won't work either. You mean it's still shaped like a regular burrito? What the fuck? Ah, uh, alright, forget it. Just put it on the menu and charge like two bucks for it. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Anyway, over the years, Taco Bell's had a lot of burrito incarnations. As mentioned, they have a small plain one and a loaded stuffed burrito, which is like the mission style ones you see everywhere now. But then, of course, they've branched out and experimented with a shit ton of new gimmicks. Yeah, for example, one of their uh, their big recent developments more recently was uh, the Quesarito, which, effectively, it's just a burrito made out of a quesadilla. If, uh, for some reason, you made it this far into a burrito podcast but aren't aware what a quesadilla is, then it's just two layers of tortillas with melted cheese in the middle. It's basically a Mexican grilled cheese sandwich. So, yeah, basically, for the Quesarito, they realized you could use a very flat quesadilla... And just use that as a wrap for your burrito, which it sounds cool, but honestly, like, it didn't really do much in practice. Like, we had them from Taco Bell, and we tried making our own homemade versions, and, like, it doesn't add much to the whole equation. Like, you get the extra cheese in there, but, like, honestly, it gets lost, like, with all the other stuff going on inside. Still, though, it is still, like, a a sight to behold, like, biting into your burrito and seeing this nice layer of orange cheese around the circumference. Yeah. Unfortunately for all you Taco Bell fans, as of August 2020, Taco Bell has taken it off their menus. They also introduced a trio of adorable little burritos back in 2012 that were referred to as the Loaded Grillers that were available in cheesy nachos, buffalo chicken, and loaded potato. Uh, they were aimed to capture like the essence of restaurant appetizers, so... Those things, from what I remember long ago, they were really, really good, and they were only like 99 cents or something. They were they were good value. Like the the chicken one got taken off the menu fairly quickly, but I I think that's probably just because like it mostly tasted like orange battery acid. <laughs> uh, the potato one was actually really tasty though. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah, the little potato one is super off the menu now too, though, since as of August 2020, Taco Bell announced they're officially removing all menu items that have potatoes in them. It's a shame, because they had quite a few potato burritos over the years, and they were tasty. The potatoes were crispy, fried potato wedges, so they offered a nice crunch inside of a messy burrito filled with all sorts of goo and mush that you all prefer not to think about when eating it. Speaking of crunchy, uh, another common theme with recent menu items that Taco Bell's been introducing is a whole lot of burritos featuring, like, chips and crunchy things inside them. So, like, this concept has, like been known to like anyone smart enough to stick potato chips inside of their sandwiches but for some reason it took a while for burritos to catch on to it as well taco bell specifically has had things like nacho burritos it had a cheeto burrito a few years back which didn't last long going with the rhyming pattern they also had a menu item that was called the frito burrito for a while actually which well contains frito corn chips honestly how the hell did it take them literally decades to come up with frito burrito it's so obvious. The recipe writes itself. Do you think they added it because of the crunchiness or because of the rhymes? Why not both? Unfortunately, according to some sources we saw, though, Taco Bell is taking the Frito burrito off their menu as of... What the hell? August 2020? What is what is with this, like, Taco Bell yes. apocalypse? taco apocalypse? <laughs> what happened? Like, what happened to them they are removing all these, like, beloved favorite menu items? I don't know. 2020 has been hard on all of us with the COVID pandemic and everything. Some companies had to make the switch over to employees working from home, and some companies just decided to eliminate 60% of their menu. Honestly, you would think in these times that they would be, like, cranking out even more, like, wacky mashup-like foods to help people munch away all their problems. Yeah, like, they could do the fireball fajita meltdown. It's in- it's infused with fireball, every 16-year-old girl's favorite whiskey. Poison your liver while you're poisoning your stomach. Ooh, or how about, like, the Starbucks Nacho Chino? It's the perfect queso-flavored espresso drink for all the basic bitches and bros out there. Craft Singles Taco Pringles? They've got tacos with a shell made of Doritos, so how about Pringles? Then fold the whole thing inside with a, of a slice of American cheese for extra trashiness. <laughs> how about the Cinnamon Toast Crunch Wrap? Because why the fuck not? Swedish Fish Tacos. <laughs> the... 
We stuck Lay's Chips, Cracker Jacks, Funyuns, Cap'n Crunch, and rice a into a wrap. Presented by PepsiCo. <laughs> Platter. <laughs> Why not? Oh, God. Yeah, the sad part is in spite of them committing genocide on their own food, uh, Taco Bell seems to be as popular as ever here. Like, every time we drive past one in our area, they, like, every time they literally have cars spilling out, overflowing the drive through into the streets. Like, it doesn't matter if it's 2 p.m., 6 p.m., 2 a.m., 6 a.m. These suckers... They just keep buying Taco Bell's shit. Maybe even literally shit. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, they keep buying it because, like I said, like at the top of this episode, when you're a stupid 20-year-old with, like, very little money, it's just, it's impossible to resist the foul allure of Taco Bell's cheap food. Very few places can you, like, just grab pocket change out of your car and walk away with a meal. Really, it's like a, it's like a bad relationship. You hit it, quit it, and then go back and get it again. <laughs> Hopefully someday all those kiddos will find their way over to a real Mexican grill so they can know the warm embrace of a really good burrito. Speaking of growing up and moving on to bigger and better burrito joints, let's talk about Chipotle. Yeah, except Chipotle sucks. Oh, yeah, you remember the beginning of this episode? You thought this episode was going to be a second about how great Chipotle is? Nah. And how good their food is? Pfft, no way. I know I made a segue about moving on to better burrito joints, and, well, let's put it this way. Chipotle is effectively just Babby's first Mexican grill. For all the numbskulls, skidding, uh, all the numbskulls sitting at the drive-thru at Taco Bell 3 o'clock in the morning, Chipotle is their first itty-bitty little steps into the world of burrito grills before making it to, you know, someplace good. Alright, alright, alright. Let me hold off a bit. I'll stop dunking on Chipotle for a second. Let's take a look at its origins. We'll go over its history because this is supposed to be an introspective. So, let's see. The first Chipotle restaurant opened in Hyde Park in New York in 1990. Uh, no, that doesn't seem right. Okay, the guy is from Hyde Park, New York, and, uh, yeah, it's another white dude. So, yeah, let's talk about the founder. So, yeah, Steve Ells attended the Culinary Institute of America before moving to San Francisco, where he became a line chef at some snooty, pretentious restaurant called Stars. He then moved out to Denver, Colorado, and supposedly applied for what, applied what he learned from his experience as a line chef to open up the very first Chipotle. Not really sure what he could have used from his time at that Stars restaurant when opening a Mexican grill. Like, that restaurant literally closed because it was too expensive. <laughs> it was highly rated and acclaimed for training celebrity chefs, but ended up going out of business because it couldn't attract enough rich people who could actually afford to eat there. <laughs> actually, you know what? Nah, that makes total sense. Like, he didn't apply anything culinary-related. He just learned that you could charge extra if you give people the impression that your restaurant is high class. Uh, honestly, it's pretty true, though. Like, all I know is every time I've gone to a Chipotle, I've left feeling, yeah, that burrito's pretty not half bad, and that's about it. I remember I was in college, and when they first started popping up in our area, everyone on campus was losing their shit. One of my friends told me, like, it was the best thing he ever ate. <laughs> okay, sure thing. Um, here's, like I said, what happens with Chipotle is kids spend the majority of their high school years and maybe early college buying Taco Bell because it's cheap and easy when you want Mexican food and burritos. But then you graduate and, well, hell, now you're a super cool and super sophisticated college student. After all, you're in fact the first person in the world to take up the noble challenge of higher learning academia. You just signed up for an intro to economics course, and now suddenly you're the smartest person in the world. Surely a man of discerning taste like yourself demands only the finest things in life. Well, in between bouts of Twitter meltdowns and shotgunning 17 beers at a party. But damn it, you're sophisticated and you want your food to reflect that. Paying 5 or $6 for a burrito? Oh, ho, 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 no, that won't do. Rather, only a burrito of the highest quality, I mean, the highest price will suffice. Ah, but what's this? A new local eatery is conveniently located within walking distance of your hallowed campus, Chipotle. Indeed, the name is also the name of a South American chili pepper. Or something, I think. Editor's note, Chipotles are actually just smoked dried jalapenos, but most people who eat Chipotle probably don't actually know that. But surely this fast-paced food establishment is promising. Why, your friend Becky O'Hara is working the line prep there. You know it must be authentic. After all, they do not use genetically modified organisms. And yes, this place is going to be your regular go-to eatery. 
a perfect compatriot for study nights in prep for next week's astronomy midterm with only the highest quality food with freshly prepared ingredients. You can be sure that this burrito's premium price implies that it is meant solely for high class individuals like yourself. And then the next like, I had the worst hangover in my life, bro. The fucking diarrhea. <laughs> I fucking demolished that toilet. <laughs> yeah, so college students, am I right, folks? <laughs> See, Chipotle is smart. We'll give them credit. They market themselves as high quality and high class. They have thoroughly convinced their fans that buying Chipotle is apparently a reasonable decision, or as reasonable as putting a 15-pound burrito into your summit can actually be. Yeah, for example, one of the things that uh, Chipotle likes to preach is that their menu is organic. Yay, organic food. It's like regular food, only more expensive. Uh, side fact, or side note, fun fact time, guys. Organic produce doesn't actually mean that it doesn't contain pesticides or chemicals. So, the bananas you just paid seven fifty for totally could have been treated multiple times with chemicals, just that they were quote-unquote organic chemicals. So, like, if some listeners aren't aware, uh, I work for a pest control company, and I actually look into organic pesticides once in a while, because I'm a fucking hypochondriac. So, I hate being exposed to chemicals. Great career choice, right? Anyway, uh, yeah, there is a USDA listing of organic pesticides which can be used on fruits and vegetables while still listing them as organic. And uh, frequently, a lot of those are pretty similar to their inorganic equivalents, just without using petroleum distillates as a mixing medium. So, uh uh-oh, organic produce can still have chemicals. Oh yeah, and while we're at it, only about half of the ingredients Chipotle uses in their burritos typically are actually USDA certified organic. So, oops. On a similar note, there seems to be this, like, preconceived notion that Chipotle is somehow healthy for you. Like, don't get me wrong, burritos in general don't really appear to contain anything nefarious. Like, no matter where you get them from, for the most part. So I don't want to say they're bad for you, but they do tend to be incredibly calorie-dense because they're huge and they contain a ton of food. But Chipotle throws around buzzwords that makes people think it's healthy, despite the fact an average meal there is, like, 1,300 calories or more. (laughs) Also, remember how they're supposed to all, like, be all about, like, quality ingredients and integrity? Well, nothing quite says quality ingredients like some good old-fashioned E. coli. (laughs) Uh, yeah, if you didn't hear or you already forgot about this or blocked it out of your memory, uh, Chipotle restaurants have been linked to E. coli outbreaks and infections on multiple occasions over the last five years. Hey, brah, how's your food? (laughs) It's good. I I, I might puke again from the E. coli, but, but man, it's good to know that 40% of the beans in the burrito are organic. The worst part is, rather than have a good laugh about it, I remember a lot of people expressing sincere empathy and sadness for it. Oh, not the people who got sick, but people who were upset for Chipotle. Like, as if Chipotle were a person, and Chipotle was the one who got hospitalized. (laughs) I mean, look, honestly, their food's fine. Like, it's not bad, but that's it. It's just fine. Them as an organization, though, well, that's a different story. The food may be good, but their company is about as pretentious as it gets. And I don't know what's more insufferable, Chipotle as a company or their fans. Yeah, people are really, really up their ass. Like, it's almost Apple levels of fanboyism. Okay, here's what it comes down to for me. Chipotle, at its core, is fast food. They dress it up all upscale, they brag about how their employees change their gloves on an hourly basis, but at the end of the day, you're getting a burrito which you could get for several dollars less at a bunch of other places that are run by, like, families. They aggressively pander to college kids, and they go out of their way to open locations close to universities because they know college kids are both ravenously hungry and the kind of idiot suckers who fall for buzzword marketing bullshit. I'm not even just saying that. The founder went out of his way to open the very first location next to the University of Denver college campus. And I'm not shit-talking the guy personally either, since like he seems like a fine enough guy. He seems like a food business genius, too. But holy shit, Chipotle as a company is the poster boy for predatory marketing. They know college kids are passionate, and public relations know that they can trick people into buying Chipotle is going to be some sort of, like, ethical choice. You know, as if any form of the meat industry could be considered sustainable or ethical when you use it to supply a huge chain with almost 3,000 locations. Oh, they make pretentious claims about how their restaurants look like farmer's markets. That's their words, not mine's. I didn't make that up. Uh, And how they prepare their burritos with traditional, authentic cooking techniques despite the fact that it's a million-dollar company founded, owned, and run by a bunch of white dudes. Meanwhile, other chains, they just kind of present themselves as like, hey, you want a burrito? Come and eat our food, it's fun. 
Hell, look at Taco Bell. They were also founded and owned by a bunch of white dudes for the longest time, but, like, they don't pretend even for a millisecond to be authentic. <laughs> like, instead, they acknowledge for themselves for what they are. They basically admit that they're cheap garbage with passable quality, and they market almost exclusively to the stoner crowd as their main fan base. Every commercial of theirs is, like, really over the top with, like, the most grovelly 90s dude voice, and it's like, Come on down to Taco Bell and get the new new Baja Blaster with a triple-decker Dorito dumper. Stick it in your fat face. Because they know that probably, like, 75% of their people are going to buy it, and they're just going to go home, they're going to eat it while greasily mashing their fingers through a run to 14th Prestige and Call of Duty. So, in their case, they know exactly what they are. Chipotle, though, not so much. Chipotle caters to this weird crowd of seemingly educated people, but who aren't quite educated enough to acknowledge that the $11 burrito they purchased is only a step and a half up from something you get from Taco Bell. So, let's be real. Enough of this. I'm done. Chipotle's love, Chipotle's life, nah. It's Chipotle's ass, Chipotle's trash. Enough said. Honestly, there's a whole host of other big burrito chains out there, too, which you can choose from, who aren't half as pretentious as Chipotle tries to be. Qdoba, Moe's, and Baja Fresh all come to mind. We don't really have time to cover their full histories, and none of them are active, as actively offensive as Chipotle is, so we won't spend much time on them. Yeah, so let's take a look at them. Uh, first off, Qdoba was founded by... Ah, okay, another couple of white dudes. Another one. Uh, in 1995, Anthony Miller and Robert Hauser opened Zuma Fresh Mexican Grill in Denver, Colorado. It's weird that it's Denver again. Like, Chipotle did their same thing. They opened their first place in Denver. Like, is there, like, a big Latino population in Denver randomly that I'm not aware of? Or do people in the mountains just, like, really, really dig burritos? I don't know. My knowledge of, like, Colorado population is South Park, so that doesn't... To be fair, though... (laughs) Uh, Casa Bonita That's true. is in South, or not in South Park, was featured in South Park, and it's, and a, real it's a real place in Colorado, so maybe there is, like, a maybe. Latino population up there. Who knows? We'll have to look into it. They, um, yeah. So the idea here was these guys wanted to make sure their customers were being served the freshest ingredients possible, and they believed that this was the big reason their store took off. Yeah, so after a few years of success, Zuma Fresh changed its name to Z-Teca Mexican Grill after they got sued by some restaurant in Boston that was also called Zuma. Ugh, friggin' litigation trolls can eat a dick. Uh, yeah, they originally named the restaurant after one of their owner's cats who was named Zuma, so, like, it's a made-up word with absolutely no meaning. But, hey, when lawyers come and knock in, not much you can do. Fuck lawyers. z began franchising after it took off in Denver, and they launched as a chain soon after. Weirdly enough, though, after spending another two or year or two as z they were sued once again by the Tejas Southwestern Grill in Arizona, and Azteca Restaurant in Washington, claiming that the name was copyright infringement. I feel bad for these guys, actually. Like, they couldn't get a break, could they? Like, shit, Zteca isn't okay either? Ugh, all right. Uh, all right, what about if we name it ZZ Grill? Nah, sorry, ZZ Top will probably sue us. Damn it. All right, what about ZZZ Grill? Nah, ZZZ kind of looks like sleeping, so Sleepies will probably sue us. Oh, okay. How about Zuma La Latica No Go? Okay, sounds good to me. Then six weeks later, son of a bitch, we're being sued by Zuma La Latica No Go Go Bagel Associates in Poughkeepsie, New York. Fuck's sake! Oh, God. Poor dudes. Yeah. Anyway, after all these lawsuits, they hired some ad agency to create a foolproof name that they owned and wouldn't result in them getting sued again. And this agency came up with the name Qdoba. I like that you can tell they were just really, really fed up and they just wanted a name that didn't exist no matter how little sense it made. So they came up with Qdoba. I mean, honestly, it's not that much more ridiculous than the name I created for that last bit. (laughs) Anyway, Qdoba got bought out by Jack in the Box in 2003, and they spent 15 years as a subsidiary for them. Uh, then they got sold to some big investment firm or something. I don't know. Wikipedia described the buyer as being uh, a consortium of funds led by Apollo Global Management. <laughs> so whatever the fuck that means. Yeah. We went to a Qdoba once on a road trip up to New Hampshire. It was pretty good. Like, I would go to them more if they were here on Long Island, but I don't think there's any around here. I think there might be, like, one in Massapequa or something. I, I don't too know. Too far away. Yeah, too far away. I'd rather go away. to New Hampshire. Yeah, I'd rather drive five hours and 40 minutes. That's how much Nassau County traffic sucks. Yeah. Long Island listeners will understand that joke. <laughs> Uh, yeah, next up, we've got Moe's Southwestern Grill, which was founded by... Huh. 
another white dude. Another one. Martin Sprock apparently opened a smoothie joint named Planet Smoothie in 1995 after graduating from the University of North Carolina. Following this, he had the vision to create a Tex-Mex version of Subway, and so he decided to open up Moe's first location, Atlanta, Georgia, in 2000. Yeah, the name Moe's is actually an acronym. I never knew this. It's uh, So M-O-E, it stands for Musicians, Outlaws, Entertainers. Makes sense. I guess it explains why a lot of their menu items are named after like pop culture references, although I'm not really sure where the outlaw part comes into play. Unless, unless the Frito Bandito never really went away and he's secretly been hiding under our noses this entire time. Anyway, uh, Moe's company goal is apparently, uh, their goal is to serve only fresh ingredients, bragging that none of the locations have freezers or microwaves. Uh Uh-huh. I'm starting to notice a trend here. Basically, every burrito franchise invented by white people, and they also like to advertise how fresh their ingredients are. I mean, not all of them are as grossly aggressive about it as a Chipotle is, but, like, honestly, this might be an unpopular opinion, but me, personally... Uh, I don't really give much of a shit how fresh your ingredients are. Uh, you're a fast food place. Like, if it tastes good and it's not actively bad for you, you could feed me a tortilla that's been sitting in a closet for the past eight months. Like, I don't care. It just seems like a pissing contest to me. Like, unless you've got a fucking farm in the back of your restaurant where every time a customer plays an order, you, like, run back there, you jog back, you got a bunch of, like, abuelos and abuelitas, like, harvesting your produce, and then they run it back to the counter, like, I don't care. Like, oh, wow, so you mean your cilantro was only picked eight days ago instead of nine days ago? Whoa, so amazing. I don't know. I guess I'm just spoiled because, like, I grew up in a family that grew a ton of produce in our backyard. So, like, literally nothing at a restaurant counts as fresh to me. But, um, yeah, we couldn't actually find much else on the history of Moe's or anything, like, interesting about them. They were bought by some firm called Focus Brands in 2007 and are now a sister company of company of Cinnabon, Auntie Anne's pretzels, and actually Carvel ice cream. I guess that tidbit is a little interesting. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, Next up, we've got Baja Fresh, which actually makes really freaking good tortilla chips, as we discovered the (laughs) other day at my parents' house. We gotta find a place that sells those. Uh, Baja Fresh opened up in 1990, and it was founded by... Yep, uh, you guessed it. Uh, another white guy. And another uh, Jim Maglos opened Baja Fresh in Newberry Park, California. Their motto was to... Oh, for fuck's sake. To serve customers the finest quality Mexican food made only with the freshest ingredients. Okay, we get it, guys. You're not serving us tomatoes that are actively rotten. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> but yeah... Uh, Baja Fresh began franchising in 1995 after it had success at its original location, and actually, it seems like these guys beat out the uh, the big burrito grill boom that took place in the mid-90s to mid-2000s. They started in 1990, which is before all these others, so hey, good for them. Hilariously enough, at one point, I read they had a CEO named Greg Dollarhide. (laughs) I feel so bad for that guy, because that's a great name, but I feel bad for him, because unless... When you're Greg Dollarhide, unless you're literally a billionaire, you cannot live up to the name Dollarhide. Like, imagine, even if you, if, if this guy lives in a fancy house in an upscale neighborhood, and he's got, like, a decent-sized yacht, there's always gonna be just, like, one person be like, huh, yeah, I guess you're, uh, I guess you're doing pretty well, Mr. Dollarhide. Uh-huh. Could be doing better, though. I just picture him as Doug Dimodome from The Fairly Odd Doug Parents. Doug Dimodome, well, <laughs> My favorite thing about Doug Dimodome is that uh, I think it's just like a style guy that no matter what scene he's in, his t- his top of his hat has to be off screen yeah. at all times. <laughs> Doug Dimodome, opener, owner of the Dugdale Dimodome. <laughs> God, that guy must have had such a hard time like doing the voice acting for that. That's a tongue twister. Oh, uh, yeah, but please, for the love of God, Greg Dollarhide, wherever you are out there, can you please promise us and the world someday one of your family will name their kid Richard? Because that's the only way to make that name even better. Like, sup, everybody? Name's Rich Dollarhide. Here's a $50 bill. Just my way of saying, nice to meet you. <laughs> Let's see. At one point, Wendy's purchased Baja Fresh in 2002, but sold them a few years later to BF Acquisition Holdings. Yeah, sounds like a real reputable organization. <laughs> Honestly, BF Acquisitions Holdings sounds like the name of a company that if you worked at it and somebody asked you what you do for a living, it would take you like 45 minutes just to give them a loose explanation. 
Yeah, uh, apparently in 2016, Baja Grill then got sold to MTY Food Group, which is where it now lives. Uh, MTY Food Group is a Canadian franchising company. It owns a bunch of brands and companies that like none of us have heard of because uh, this podcast is primarily focused on a U.S. audience, so sorry, Canadian listeners. But I guess write in if you've ever heard of Thai Express, Veggie Rama, Cafe Rama, O Burger, Croissant Plus, or Taco Time. So, yeah, that's more or less all the big burrito chains out there that we could really mention. Uh, there's a bunch of others we could look into, but, like, we're going to stop here because, well, giant franchise companies get all the attention. So, you know, let's turn our folks to, like, other places. Sure, like, the big franchises, they're recognizable, but, like, when it comes to burritos and Tex-Mex, your best bet is to just go find a nice hole in the wall mom and pop's Mexican grill. As we mentioned, there's tons of great Mexican restaurants out there in the U.S., especially in areas with Latino populations. If you're lucky enough to live in a place, like, take advantage of it. Next time you're craving a burrito, don't just default to horseshit like Chipotle. Go find someplace new. Go find unassuming little eateries in a random strip mall. Everyone loves to go on and on and on about how we need to support small businesses and how corporations are evil. And they'll say this while holding a Starbucks cup right before they suggest going to Chipotle for lunch. Yeah, like, look. I am the polar opposite of politically correct. I think people who complain about cultural appropriation are fucking idiots. But I do call them as I see them. And frankly, opening a Mexican grill when you're just the whitest white dude, well, it's fine. But don't act like you're like the leading authority on this ethnic dish that people have been cooking for centuries in their homes. You want to open a chain? Cool. Go for it. Just don't pat yourself on the back too many times while you boast about how authentic your cooking techniques are, because... You know, that's like finding a TV show like 10 years after it finishes, binging it, and then lecturing all of its fans about how great it is. Like, hey, did you see this show, man? You have no idea how good it is. I think everyone has a right to experiment with all sorts of cool cuisines, and oftentimes it leads to a lot of cool ideas and awesome fusion dishes. Like, that said, if I'm looking for a classic traditional burrito, though, I'm going to go to a place that's like playing salsa and reggaeton on the radio, which actually gets patronized by Latino people. Hell, Here on Long Island, we're really fortunate. Like, just in the immediate area around our town, Patchogue, where we live, there's Mexican Grill 2000, Swell Taco, Del Fuego, Senor Taco, Avocados, Chimichanga Grill, Burrito Palace, Salsa Salsa, California Cactus, Viva La Vida, Cactus Cafe, La Fonda Mexican Grill, and that's all just within, like, 10 to 15 minutes driving distance. Oh, and even cooler, speaking of fusion cuisine before, there's even a burrito grill around here owned by Middle Eastern people where they prepare halal-style burritos. Like, they have stuff like curry burritos and chicken tikka burritos and chicken korma burritos. It's amazing. Yeah, that's a good example of what I'm talking about. Like, okay, as a couple of white people ourselves who love other cultures' cuisines, I'd be lying if I said we wouldn't be into the idea of opening, like, a Japanese Western Yoshoku fusion restaurant or, like, a curry house or something. But... I think if you're going to take a, like take up the task of cooking some other like culture's cuisine, you better do something cool with it. Be original, because otherwise there's no point in doing the same thing that someone else has been doing better than you and more authentically than you for like centuries before this. Yeah, and really, best of all, if you go hunt down some local Mexican girls in your area, you'll end up saving money and probably end up getting yummier food. Like, sure, you may end up in a place that doesn't look like it was built last week with state-of-the-art building engineering, and like oh my god it might not have wi-fi but come on you're getting a freaking burrito what more could you want also randomly a lot of mexican girls have murals painted on them around here so oftentimes they double as poke stops if you're playing pokemon go yeah that's always fun wait for your food take over the gym (laughs) uh the the hell the sky is the limit with burritos like people are doing all sorts of like cool shit with them like burrito bowls like we mentioned at the beginning of the episode they're effectively just like all the ingredients inside of a burrito but they're served in a bowl without the tortilla although like i said sometimes they get the tortilla so eh. the the like the tortilla list versions it's perfect for people who are trying to cut back on their carbs or people who can't eat gluten uh we couldn't really find any concrete origin stories for the burrito bowl but it seems like it probably came somewhere out of the southwest in the 1960s uh its cousin the taco salad was invented in texas between 1960 and 1962 so probably followed suit there Randomly, Wikipedia also listed, uh, like, a major bullet point that burrito bowls are now featured as a U.S. Army MRE ration as of 2017. (laughs) I don't know why. Like, I'm not knocking it, because 
I just didn't think burrito bowls were popular enough to that to be a big deal. Like, um, they're good though. We, I actually had one this summer when we went camping. Like, it was legitimately actually good. Like, it tasted just as good as anything I ever got from Chipotle or any of these other places. And it was made of a bunch of vacuum sealed vegetables and beans and sauce that was prepared like three years ago. So, hmm, looks like freshness isn't as big of a deal as these places make it out to be. <laughs> Another modern adaptation of the burrito is the sushi burrito. If you've never had one or heard of it, well then, it's exactly what it sounds like. You take nori seaweed, which is what normal maki sushi rolls are generally wrapped in, but take a big sheet of it, then place down a layer of sushi rice, add meats and veggies and sauces or dressings, and fold up into, well, a burrito. It's Japanese-American fusion at its finest. Yeah, the sushi burrito was invented in San Francisco by Peter Yen in 2008. I couldn't find a lot of background info on on yen but uh it sounds like he didn't have a lot of culinary training he was more into like the business end of things but the guy did like sushi quite a bit um in the mid 2000s while working a bunch of different jobs in the bay area he found himself getting sushi for lunch pretty often he noted to himself there was like you know only two extremes that you could get for sushi around there cheap sushi which you got at grocery stores which was lower quality but it was uh you know cheaper or you get expensive sushi, which you get a restaurant, which, you know, they were really good, but they were more of an investment of time and money because you had to sit down and dine. Uh, so this guy, Peter Yen, he became, you know, basically a human documentary. Like, the world turned black and white. He looked to the sky and exclaimed, there's gotta be another way. See, the main conundrum here is that sushi is a very hands-on dish to make. It needs to either be made fresh or refrigerated immediately. And it's not portable by any means unless packed up. Yen figured if you left the sushi rolls whole, they'd be easier to eat on the go, and it gave him the idea to mimic Western-style wraps that are already popular. Bam! The sushi burrito was invented. So, Yen started exploring restaurant ownership in 2008. Uh, he started toying with the ideas of making a store centered around, well, sushi burritos. A few years later, he got in touch with his future head chef, Tai Mahler, and then in January 2011, they officially opened their first store, aptly called Sushi Rito. Since then, Sushi Rito has opened several other locations, and dozens of other stores have stolen their idea and turned the Sushi Burrito into a food that belongs to the people. But as far as I know, this guy Yen has been classy about it. Never made any lawsuits or anything over it, so good for him. Guy took it in stride and let his creation become a mainstream treasure. He seems like a good dude. Yeah, to be honest, we've never had Sushi Burritos before. I kind of want to try one. There might be a place in New York City that serves them. I'm sure there is, but uh, we'll have to chunk it out the next time we go into the city. Because, like, it's been, like, a year since we've headed in, for obvious reasons, because of the pandemic. Uh, but actually, you know what, never mind. We can just make our own. It seems easy enough. We make sushi all the time at home. And, like, hell, like, we make burritos at home all the time, too. Like, more people should make burritos. They're really easy. And they're a perfect way to reuse leftovers. If you've got leftover rice, and you've got leftover chicken, then good news, buddy. You've got the building blocks to make a burrito at home. And best of all, they're both highly customizable and free, unlike stupid ass Chipotle. And, actually, much like a burrito, this modern day section was stuffed. Because, holy shit, that was a long one. So, that should cover it for today's main course. I hope you guys saved room, as always, for some dessert. Oh, yeah, this episode is running real long, but... Hey, if there's any episode that should be jam-packed with a ton of content, burritos make sense. Oh, I hope you guys are all ready for some review roast, because we sure as shit are. We haven't done one of these in a few weeks, but it's actually my favorite segment, because I love making fun of idiots on the internet. I like shitty recipes, because it's fun watching you guess. <laughs> you like seeing my wacky cartoon reactions to everything. Yeah. Review uh, roast is fun, too, though. It is. They're all fun. This podcast is fun. I hope you're all having fun, too, listeners. Anyway, if this is your first time, Review Roast is a recurring column where we browse online reviews of our favorite local restaurants and we valiantly defend their honor against the villains who have sullied their hallowed name. There's a lot of assholes out there and we don't have time to roast them all, so let's see what we can find. Today, we are going to be taking a look at reviews for Red Tiger Dumpling House, which is uh, it's up in Stony Brook here on Long Island in New York. Um, it's funny because I actually didn't write down <laughs> what place we were doing. I just wrote down all the reviews. Uh, Red Tiger Dumpling House. It's, it's a, I mean, it, it's a it's Chinese. It sounds like it's a dumpling house. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
it's like a it's a more traditional like you know more slightly authentic chinese restaurant but like it's not a chinese restaurant it's not like you're it's not chinese takeout yeah that you can take out from there yeah i i feel like a recurring theme with a lot of the reviews we read was people seem to be under the impression it's like a crappy like chinese american sit down place that does like take out and you just go there for like chicken and broccoli and like sesame chicken and all that shit yeah it's really good though i actually i feel like i encourage us to go there because i read about they make soup dumplings which sounded like magic and they are magic if you've never like if you've never had soup dumplings it's like so like if you've ever had like wontons it's kind of like the wonton like wrappery part but somehow they enclose soup in it like i it's, honestly don't yeah. even know how they do it but they're so good and they're like magic so we went there to try those and then just they have lots of different dumplings and buns and like fried rice and like they have a lot of good stuff and so we really like them oh and bubble tea they have yeah they tea. have a lot of bubble tea they're like they're very much like a very like much like we were saying with burrito places they're a very hole in the wall establishment like it's not fancy it's not the cleanest but like you go in and for like, you know, 20 bucks, you can get a bunch of dim sum. And also, for the record, PSA to everybody. I've noticed this happen with people in reviews in the past. I think a lot of Americans are under the impression that dim sum is like one type of food. Because that's what's labeled as at like uh, like Chinese American restaurants. Yeah. It's like dim sum. It's just that one that's like round and like open on the top with like mystery meat that you don't want to actually know what it is stuffed inside yeah uh but like dim sum is actually just like kind of like chinese appetizers almost it's chinese finger food like it's not just one thing it's a shit ton of like buns uh like dumplings like sweet things and like pastries and stuff like it's 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 i don't know it's basically like i said it's it's, a category of food it's a category of food it's like you know it is it's like uh in spain they have tapas in China, they have uh, they have dim sum. So this restaurant specializes in that, and like you said, like it's one of the few places around here where you can go for like real authentic dim sum. So yeah, but like I said, it's not like a five star like up class like super fancy restaurant. They do have some nice decorations. They're fun. They do. They're fun. I'm just saying it's not a big giant oh, place. Yeah. Like, it's a little cramped. It's small. Like I said, it's a little like shabby inside. But they have amazing food, and you can't get that kind of food like most places. So, eh. So now that we've given a, uh, we've we've defended it. Let's defend it even more from the uh, the dum dums. <laughs> yeah, from the dum dums on the idiot. Uh, particularly, we pulled from Yelp and Google, and also some place I've never heard of called Zomato. What? The- yeah, I don't know. Um, let's take a look at this first one, which is a one star review on Yelp from Carlos D. This place should just get rid of all their vegan options because they will 10 out of 10, 100% of the time, mess up your order. I only keep going back because family insisted each and every time I told them, I told you so. Even when ordering through DoorDash or any other app, you can blatantly write vegan orange chicken and they still mess it up. No use in calling it vegan because they'll just make you go in there with the whole purpose of ordering takeout is to stay home. Terrible. This, like, this review, like, is not even that funny, but more just, like, uh, I just, like, find it, like, stupid because... It's another case of vegans expecting the entire fucking world and every culture on the planet to revolve around their, like, very niche diet. Yeah. Like, we've been there and seen their menu, too. And, like, I don't really... Like, maybe you have to ask to see a vegan menu. But, like, maybe. I don't even remember them, like, labeling anything as vegan, so... Yeah, not for nothing, but, like... And this is not me stereotyping. This is, like, a matter of fact. Uh, veganism tends to be a very Western idea and mindset. In the East, like a lot of Asian countries, particularly like, you know, like Northern Asia, Northeast Asia, they don't really like, a lot of people probably don't even know what veganism is. And it's not common there. Mm -hmm. Like, like there's seaweed and fish sauce. Like they show fish in like everything. Yeah. I read it. I was listening to one of my like learn Japanese or like podcasts where it was, he was interviewing some woman who like deals with people who move to Japan and like basically have culture shock. And she like walks them through life in Japan she said a common thing she sees from time to time is people who are vegan who are mad that stuff like tofu has like fish broth and they're like but it's tofu it's supposed to be vegetarian but meanwhile in japan tofu is not a vegetarian food tofu is just a staple food that they eat and telling the japanese to not use fish broth in the thing (laughs) fuck you 
But so that's basically what's going on here. This guy's mad that a very authentic Chinese restaurant uh, is not like doing a good job yeah. on vegan food. Also, I'd like to point out this review. That's the only review he's ever written on Yelp. So the guy what? literally created a Yelp account to complain that they didn't have enough vegan food there or whatever. Yeah, like oh no, a non-vegan restaurant didn't have vegan food for me. Ah, uh, yeah, like one not, star. Not to mention like. Take this what you will, but, like, China, not the best country when it comes to, like, you know, vegetarian stuff, considering, like, we literally have a pandemic yeah. because they have a pretty shabby record when it comes to, uh, like, uh, animal Animals animal eat. treatment and wellness when it comes to, like, food because they just, like, have markets filled with, like, fucking cages and cages of, like, animals sitting on top of each other because they like eating animals a lot in China. So... Some, like, you know, Chinese people open a restaurant here and you're pissy that they're like, oh, it had milk in it. Oh, there's one star. Like, so get the fuck out of here. Similarly, we had another review from Samantha Grimaldi, who is also vegan on Google. She has one star review. Do not go here. Do not trust the food there if you have any sort of dietary restrictions. They have a whole section of the menu labeled vegan that I ordered from. My boyfriend went to pick up the food. They said it would be about 20 minutes. And in 45 minutes of waiting, the food came out. And when it came out, they said, oh, by the way, this has bacon in it. He told them, I cannot eat bacon because I am a vegan. Hence why I ordered off the vegan menu. And all they had to say was, yeah, that's why we told you. And when he asked why it was labeled as vegan, they couldn't give him an answer. She then goes on to complain about, like, vegan bullshit. Here's what I think happened. Uh, we can give you the information here. We've never seen bacon anywhere in that restaurant. They don't sell anything with bacon in it. I double-checked their menu online. They don't have bacon anywhere in that restaurant. Do they even have a vegan section? Like, maybe. I, I, I honestly don't, know. don't remember ever seeing it. Whatever. She claims that she ordered from the vegan menu. But so here's what happened. They don't have bacon there anywhere that's not a thing that exists in that restaurant as far as i can like pretty well discern what i think happened was some of the people that work there have very thick chinese accents so she probably said i want vegan food and then when they brought it out they probably said oh by the way this is vegan and he probably said bacon they said yeah vegan and so they probably thought that when they especially because when she she claims that when they said but she ordered vegan food and they said yeah that's why we told you that they probably were like yeah Vegan. <laughs> and they probably heard, yeah, bacon, because you're a fucking stupid white idiot who's just like, no, oh, I want vegan food. So, and yeah. They probably couldn't give you an answer because they were probably like, what the fuck is this yeah, person's problem? Like, or giving well, them the vegan food they want. Yeah. So, yeah, because, like I said, they legitimately don't serve bit. What Chinese place has bacon, for yeah. fuck's sake? Like, ugh. So, yeah, yeah. they have, like, Chinese food has really good, like, roast pork. Yeah, pork but, like, belly and shit. Not bacon. They have no need for bacon in yeah. Chinese food. <laughs> Uh, you want to read this next one? Sure, I'll read this R. one. This is from Paul R. on Yelp. Another one-star review. Most ill-conceived Chinese place you can possibly get on Long Island. I came here based on friends telling me how great it is. I am contemplating not speaking to them ever again. This was horrible on every level. Staff, food, and the wait time was worst of all. Waiting 45 minutes for lo mein and dumplings is a sin. The red tiger is an unapproachable beast. Steer clear. Jeez. Like what a sourpuss! I know. Also, I don't like. Everyone has busy days and stuff, but like we've gone there multiple times when they're busy, and we've never had to wait forty-five minutes for anything. I saw a lot of reviews complaining about a long wait time, and what I'm assuming is when you and me go in, it's just you and me. We sit down, we yeah. get like one thing of like buns and one thing of dumplings, and it takes like ten yeah, minutes. Maybe some scallion pancakes. Yeah, maybe scallion pancakes. Hey, their scallion pancakes are really good. <laughs> yeah, but then what we'll also see is off to the left, we'll see a big fucking just like gavon like table of like eight people ordering like every food that exists in the restaurant. So I feel like a lot of people go in there, and like I said, this place is tiny and it's kind of shabby, so they probably don't have like the kitchen set up and the staff to like serve in a giant like party people. Also, I like this guy just like flat out says i'm thinking of not speaking mm -hmm. to my friends ever again because he didn't like this place he must have like I, I'm gonna if you go live out. in a world where a bad food recommendation is like the worst thing your friends can do worthy of like not speaking to them either you have like awesome friends that have never done anything shitty to you or like you just have like yeah. ridiculously <laughs> high standards i'm gonna just say i'm gonna go out on a leaf and say paul art doesn't have any friends or there's that because he sounds like a douchebag and uh yeah so, also, like, what does most ill-conceived Chinese place, like, even mean? I think that's in regards to, like I said before, I think a lot of people walk into this restaurant expecting, like, I want, they think it's gonna be, like, a fucking 
they think it's gonna be like golden palace like chinese buffet or something yeah. they think they're gonna walk in come out with a fucking plate full of crab legs and like they're like, i want the beef and broccoli chicken basket like that's not what this place is so if you like i said I, that's a running theme a lot of people are mad that it wasn't a chinese american place uh so, like on that same note we have stephanie d who also gave it a one star review on yelp I was truly disappointed with this restaurant. From the moment I entered the place with my friends, I thought it would be a cute little Asian eatery. I was wrong. The food was terrible. And believe me, I eat authentic Asian food often. The soup was not hot and the dumplings were too doughy. The chicken was not fresh and hard. I couldn't force feed myself to eat anymore after a couple of bites. On top of all that, it was difficult to even place an order at all because the waitress didn't even speak English. It was too expensive. Not recommended at all. So, yeah, here's... Um, I would argue it is a cute little Asian eatery. Yeah, uh, what, what I like to point out, though, this is very obviously just, like, a fucking just Becky-ass, like, like basic white girl yeah. who thinks because she, like, went out with her friends for ladies' night to, like, I don't know, like, Crystal Buffet or whatever, she goes to a lot of authentic Asian eateries. So, like, the fact that you walked in and, like, you're just like it's i thought it'd be a cute little asian eerie but then you're mad that the, the waitress, the doesn't, waitress speak doesn't speak english like what the fuck is wrong with you what do you expect yeah like that's just like i i'm i'm mad for that waitress I wherever know. she may exist at this point yeah. in time and like yeah a lot of the wait like wait staff does have accents and so like but like they know enough English to understand the menu items that's on their menu where they work. So like, yeah. I don't understand why ordering would be a problem. They unless know more about a, the food on their menu than yeah, you do. Unless you're being a picky ass who is like, can I get this but without this? Or can I substitute that? Like, if you're trying to get a lot of, like, things in, then, yeah, it can be a problem. Like, yeah, then we've get run out. Into that, Go like, somewhere else. Like, we run into that with, like, because your sister is celiac. So, like, mm -hmm. trying to, like, explain gluten-free at Asian restaurants. Yeah, with we've the run language trouble with that sometimes. Kind of tricky. Yeah, but, so. like, I don't know. Even still, like, if you're just ordering off the menu, the waitress is, like, English comprehension shouldn't be an issue. <laughs> yeah, especially when you're like, I go to a lot of authentic Asian <laughs> eateries. It's like, I don't think you do because that's like a common thing at uh, most Chinese restaurants yeah. is people have accents because, whoa, there are people from not America. Whoa, wow, who'd have thought it? Um, do you want to read this next one? This one's just puzzling. Gary A. Sure. Uh, all right, Gary A from Yelp. Have eaten here about 10 times. The soup dumplings are a must. Try the crab and pork mixture. It's very light, but be careful as the soup is very hot. They have wonderful rolled scallion pancakes filled with beef or pork. This is not a normal Chinese takeout. It is more in the line of traditional Szechuan cuisine you would find in China. They have hot pots and many other unusual choices. Believe it or not, as an unusual twist, they have bubble tea in many flavors. As she says, twist the have bubble tea in many flavors. Yeah. I corrected. <laughs> Highly recommend, but plan on waiting for a seat as it's small. And this was an update, right? Yeah. Very disappointed with today's visit. Drove half an hour to find a handwritten sign saying they were closed. Hope it's not permanent, dot, dot, dot. And then it's a one star. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, like, most of his, like... His review we agree with like it's all pretty accurate his whole review it's all positive. is praising like i've eaten there 10 times the food is great the dumplings are a must and it's you even don't want them to be permanently closed yeah but like, then one star because they were closed once yeah I, that's just bonkers like i get it like go, like looking forward to eating something and then going there and it's closed like that's a major bummer but like i would never hold that against them in a review like unless i yeah. called them and was like are you guys open Will you be open for another half hour? And they said yes. And then I drove there and they were closed. Then I'd be like, all right, well, like they the lied guys to in, me. The guys but in like, the phone are just like, yeah, we're going to be open the next half hour. It's like, ah, this jackass. I'm gonna, let's, let's run. Yeah, you you go at the door now. We'll run out. And then when he gets here, he's going to laugh behind the dumpster. <laughs> but like, considering it was like a handwritten note too, like, I feel like there was probably like some emergency came up yeah. or something. Like they had to close unexpectedly. That, like, that's just insanity. Yeah, like, that's why madness. Would you hold to that be like, I them. love this place. I've been here 10 times and I want to keep going. Oh, but they were closed one time. One star. Fuck you. Also, like, I don't know. Driving a half hour isn't even like I drive a half hour to work every day. Like, yeah, that's not, not that, a big deal. It's not that big of a sin. Um, you could do this next one too, All Becky right. G. <laughs> um, literally Becky. Like after I keep the <laughs> other girl being a Becky, this girl is literally Becky G from Yelp. They stole my credit card number and spent a thousand dollars at Abercrombie and Baby Gap. Use cash. Yeah, uh, that never happened. <laughs> 
<laughs> that that's a lie. Um, I think she just got her credit card number stolen from somewhere, yeah. probably because she's an idiot, and she just pinning it on them. Yeah, like you can assume it was might have been one of the people there if like that was one of the last places you used it, but like you can't pin it down to them. Yeah, and uh, don't uh, fucking leave a one star review based on pure speculation. Yeah. Also, like they rec- they they like prefer if you use cash. So like. Yeah, they, okay. <laughs> they actively, as we'll cover in a couple other art, like uh, reviews. Like, there were a lot of reviews too, complaining about like credit minimums and stuff. Like, what? Like, so you're telling me they're like, please don't use credit cards. Please give us cash tips. If you have to use a credit card, it has to be over twenty five dollars. And then also, you think they stole your credit yeah. card? What is that? that that's your punishment? Like, yeah. if you you used a credit card at our establishment, we're gonna go to Abercrombie and Baby Gap, like. <laughs> Uh, I don't know about that. I'm trying to remember. Like, if you pay with card, don't you... Wait, do you pay at the register or do you give them the card? I think you pay at the register. Because then, like, how are they even going to steal it? Unless you did, like, exactly. online like order. They said but... it. That, that, that never <laughs> happened. That's fantasy. It never happened. Ah, uh, this is another one. Uh, low... Uh, let's see. Monty S. on Yelp. Another one-star view. The absolute worst customer service. These guys are clueless and cheap. What Chinese place charges for white rice? Uh, a lot of places. Almost every yeah, one of them. And better, they charge for hot sauce. I mean, come on, get with it. And talking to the employees is a joke. Half of them comprehend what you were saying. Giving them one star was hard for me. So, he's a low-key racist. It's another one of these idiots who are mad that Chinese people... Are in working a, in a Chinese in restaurant. a Chinese restaurant. No, I want my Chinese restaurant to be run by white people. <laughs> People that were that, that speak American. I don't want to have to like. I don't care if it's authentic or if there's actually people who know what they're cooking. Yeah. Ugh. Seriously, I, though, what Chinese restaurant doesn't charge like does like I, when you order a takeout? Know. I feel like you know what happens. I feel like when you order a takeout, a lot of times you end up ordering a combo, yeah. which comes yep. with white rice. Yep. So people think you're just getting the white rice for yep, free, yep, yep, but yep. it's not. It's built into the price of the combo yeah, you, you look, just ordered. Yeah. You look at the combo and it lists all the things. Yeah. Like if you ordered a fucking I don't know if you ordered. Say you order, like, a thing of fried rice. They're not going to just throw in yeah. a, just a pint of white rice with your fried rice. Order. If you look at any Chinese restaurant menu, like, takeout Chinese restaurant, there's a thing on the thing. Like, if you want extra for, like, white rice, there's a price next to it. It's not just, like, free. Yeah. Free white rice. Just just throwing away. You get a white rice. You get a white <laughs> rice. Rice for everybody. Except ducks because it kills them. <laughs> uh, this next one comes from Justin Ari on Google, who gives it a one-star review. Definitely use MSG. I linked shortness of breath and chest tightness to this food. I used to like them, but they must have changed their ingredients. He spelled there wrong. They must have changed their ingredients to include the use of MSG. Uh, I got news for you, Justin Ari. You're a fucking moron. Because countless studies have shown that... Like double blind studies. Double blind studies have shown MSG does not cause any ill health effects. There's no such thing as MSG sensitivity. Look it up. It's It's been done dozens of times. And actually, it's linked to people who were just, like, low-key racist in, like, yeah. the 50s. They, they've done studies. They've literally done studies. And, like, they've had people sit down at a Chinese restaurant, given one group MSG, given the other group not MSG. And then afterwards, they ask them, like, oh, uh, so we gave one group MSG and the other group not And then people will be like... Oh my god, I knew it. I knew I had MSG because I can't really breathe and I'm sweating. And they'll be like, you got a dish that didn't have MSG yeah. in it, so you're full of shit. And yeah. then all the people that had MSG were fine. Yeah. So, yeah. This, like it's, the, not, it's not the restaurant's fault if you're just having a heart attack, dude. Like, sorry. Yeah, that, if you're having a heart attack, then, uh, you know, if, if you're a fat guy and you just always have chest tightness and trouble breathing, that's not MSG's fault. MSG being linked to health problems... Uh, started off in like the 50s and 60s when people didn't know what MSG was. They yeah. just saw it like, oh, it's a scary chemical name that the Chinese and the Orient are using. So it got this like mystical status and it just kind of like, like I said, people were just like, oh, the, the, the Chinese, all oh, the Chinese people are using MSG. In their-. You know what MSG is made from like nine times out of 10? Corn. <laughs> they like, they take corn and they ferment it and then they like soak it or something. And like, MSG is a naturally occurring compound like they call it umami in japanese or whatever yeah. and it's just found in foods it's not some like fucking like pesticide or whatever <laughs> that we were talking about pesticides or so yeah uh justin art you're uh you're another one who's just like low-key racist and like i said you're also a fucking moron um yeah so these are left <laughs> uh, couple so i don't know we got one guy who just blatantly lies about like them telling you not to use credit cards um 
he uh, he he claims that they Tony R and Google claim you want me one to read star. It? Now we'll just skip it. Mm. He he says that they that they uh, they never tell you about you a convenience fee um, if you use a credit card, but that's a lie. They have, yeah, they have signs everywhere, signs. like on the table at the register. At the register, yeah, saying so. Uh, this guy's full of shit. Yeah. They even have I don't know if they still have it, but last time we were there, they even had like a special like cash menu where the items were a little cheaper. Mm-hmm. If she's like to reward you for paying with cash. Maybe they did that in response to morons who can't freaking read. Maybe uh, this next one comes from Zomato.com. Ah, Zomato, and this is is jimmy k who leaves a one-star review this food is uh, the food at this establishment is fair at best the business end of the establishment is below poor the staff should be sent to classes to learn people skills my bill came to 1895 he spent bill came as one word <laughs> uh i handed the cashier a credit card left a six dollar tip at the table the young untrained arrogant girl firmly told me that she will not accept a credit card uh, order under $25 and then she told me that we could go across the street to get cash to pay for the bill. I checked my pockets. I only had $15. My wife had to go across the street in 20 degree weather to get money out of the ATM and pay a $3 fee. I was extremely embarrassed. The proper thing would have been to take my credit card and charge the $18.95 and then tell me the next time it needs to be $25. I'm going to stop you right there um because jimmy k no that is not the proper thing to do the proper thing would be to tell you no this is our store policy here's a sign saying 25 dollar minimum so you're full of shit all right you don't tell a business what the proper thing to do is especially that uh you're complaining like you're complaining that the chick that was running the register said you can go get cash from yeah. an atm so so let me get this like made you wash dishes yeah so so let me get this straight you you went against their company policy and then the cashier presented you with a solution on how to rectify that by going to get cash from an ATM that's literally across yeah. the street. You didn't have to drive or anything. Also, classy move sending your wife in the 20 yeah, weather exactly. and then being like, my wife had to go across the street to get it. Be so, like, okay. So you're mad that they helped you and prevent, presented you with a solution. Uh, he finishes up by saying... Uh, if this is the last place on earth that had food, I would starve because I would never eat there again. Good. Starve to death. Nobody <laughs> cares. No one would be sad. I somehow believe putting a minimum on credit card is illegal. That's that's bullshit. That's S- absolutely bullshit. Absolute bullshit. I've been to hundreds so many of stores and, and restaurants in my life that have credit card minimums. Yeah. I urge everyone who reads this post not to patronize their establishment. This guy is such a piece of shit. <laughs> I hate people like this because... He is just telling this private business how he thinks they should operate. Yeah. He thinks they should not have this policy, but then says, oh, but you should make an exception just for me because I can't read. And then complaining and saying, I don't think it's legal to put a credit card in, which it absolutely is. Yeah. Businesses can fucking do whatever they want. They can take credit cards. They don't have to take credit cards. Yeah, it's their fucking don't company. Even take credit cards. Yeah. You Your company ha- doesn't take credit My cards. My company doesn't take credit cards. I've been saying we should, but we don't. And if, I don't know, like, so you know what? If you're if you're mad, whatever. If you go open your own Chinese restaurant, yeah. all right, and accept credit card. Tell people they can charge two cents and fucking and have a great day. Ugh, you could read. We'll this is running low. We got two more, but uh, these two last two are some uh, real uh, real real good ones. So you could read this next one, Christine right. LaFrance on Google. All right, all right, uh, okay. The food was nothing. The, the food was good, nothing great. The service is bad. Our waiter was the rudest person I have ever met in my entire life. He screamed at me and my husband because he, we didn't answer him fast enough and ordered something that he said was not on the menu. Yeah, that never happened. <laughs> I have never been treated so poorly, and of course we were not going to give him a big tip. And he made a complaint of it, was insisting that we give him more money. That also never happened. <laughs> the guy was so rude and screams at us, and then insisted we give him a bigger tip. These people are crazy. After leaving, we actually realized that they overcharged us be careful this is not the first time that these people have done this i have heard done this i have heard this yeah check your bill they overcharge and scam you like yeah that didn't happen like yeah. like i said we've been there multiple times all the times the wait staff is just like polite asian people and like i can't imagine any of them like confronting anyone about a bigger tip first of all yeah no one in the history of restaurants has ever done that without getting fired yeah. first of all and yeah they don't could you imagine just a a, a waiter or whatever just screaming at yeah. customers in the middle of a restaurant i feel like she's using the term screaming very um hyperbolically if that's the correct word because like all right like 
Chinese language, it can be like kind of harsh. Like my boss is like a Chinese. Like I've heard yeah, Chinese you have a lot being of spoken. Chinese coworkers. Yeah, and like <clears throat> it can like sometimes it just sounds angry even when they're not angry. So like it's possible like they order something that wasn't on the menu and he was just like oh like he says something like to the effect of like. That's not on the menu. Like, he's probably said something. He probably but just, said something very, like, assertively yeah. forward. Like, what? No, that's not on the menu. Yeah, like, he probably just said that. But, like, because of his, like, accent or whatever. Like, if... First of all, I'm sure it wasn't screamed. Yeah. But she just that, probably that read it as aggressively. She's and is an like, idiot. this guy yelled. He screamed at me. <laughs> well, so here's an interesting thing is I went and checked out Christina LaFrance's other reviews on Google. And half of them were her complaining about the staff. Saying that the staff is rude, the staff treated her poorly. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here, and I'm gonna guess that Christina LaFrance, uh, I think you're the problem. Yeah. When every restaurant you go to, the staff is rude to you. Uh, kind of yeah. sounds like you're the asshole here. Yeah, seems like you're the problem. Also, uh, another uh thing that I discovered her. So that ice cream bar that opened up near us recently, Cloud Nine, they're fantastic. She left them a one-star review saying, first of all, this place is very confusing. I was online for 20 minutes and you got to wait another 20 minutes for ice cream. 20 bucks, two ice creams. You figure it's going to be really good. Not the case. I will not go back. Um, there's nothing confusing about this ice cream place. Yeah. You walk in. There is a sign that says the prices. There is a sign that says the specials. And then you walk up and you say, I want that one. Yeah. And like, then five minutes later, you get ice cream. Yeah. And like you can like create your own like combinations because what they do, their gimmick is like they crush up cereal into the ice cream and then put some fun toppings on it. Like it's really good. So like you can make your own like combinations and like that could be overwhelming. But like if it's your first time there, just order one of the freaking combinations. Yeah, that's like, why they put ones. specials up on yeah. a big giant sign you can't miss. And so like... We've never had to wait that long, but that's because we go, like, early in the day before the line gets long. Like, we've driven by at night where it is a long line, so I believe that they waited 20 minutes to get inside. I don't believe they waited another 20 minutes for the yeah, that cream, place. Though. That place gets hopping at night, and that's probably what happened. You can't be mad that a business is being successful. Yeah. The world does not revolve around you. Other people exist. I know that's hard to believe, Christina <laughs> LaFrance, which, what the fuck is that? Really, Your last name's LaFrance? Okay. But, like, other people exist. Shocker. And other people might want ice cream. Whoa. So if other lots of people want ice cream yeah. and you happen to be in back of them, then yes, you have to wait for 20 minutes because the world doesn't fucking cater to you exclusively. Yeah. And it seems like you're an asshole who just runs into this problem that not everything revolves around you no matter where you go, which is why you then interpret all rude or all staff as being rude at, at like restaurants. Because in her mind, I think what she wants is she gets to walk into a restaurant and and every fucking employee yeah. stops with her. Do they drop dishes? They break on the floor and they all run over her to her and they say, how can we worship you, your majesty? And they fucking, they sit her down in a recliner and then she's like, chop, chop, bring me the finest. And they give her a foot rub and they're like massaging her scalp and they just like, they make food. There's a guy, there's, there's five chefs on, on the premise at all times waiting for Christina LaFrance to walk into the fucking restaurant just like ready to go like get, get it out get it out all that food's gotta be perfectly cooked get it out to her she's an ass she's just a bitter piece of shit who just like goes around and thinks everyone is treating her poorly because she treats everyone else poorly yeah. Fuck I you. don't this is also like I don't know I don't like people who complain about wait times when there's a line like if you sit are seated at a restaurant and it takes like an hour for your food to come out then that sucks and it's shitty like i get it but if you see a huge ass line or if you're told at like the like whatever the hostess tells you it's gonna be like a 30 or 45 minute wait and then you still like stand around and or sit around and wait then like that's on you you saw there was gonna be a wait and you still decided to like you can't hold that against the restaurant like you said it's like you're you're being mad that yeah. they're being successful like if you don't want to wait then leave and go back like it sucks but like we've Hi, Charlie. We've done that. We've been like, oh, this wait is too long. We're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. And like, oh, well. Yeah, I don't know. So she sucks. Um, let's let's wrap it up with this last review here, which is, comes from Dick G on Yelp. And uh, Dick's very uh, fitting <laughs> name, this douchebag. Um, so Dick G here appears to be like the poster boy for like just insufferable twats on Yelp. Like... 562 reviews, 3,882 photos, and he's Yelp elite status, despite the fact that this review contains numerous, like, grammatical errors and spelling mistakes and just generally reads like it was written by a third grader. He His review, to be fair, it's for two stars, not one star, but he says, 
Bon G and I were visiting a doctor near... First off, who the frig is Bon? Nobody cares who Bon is. Nobody knows who Bon is. He probably, like, cop- he probably wrote a review on, like, Facebook or something, too, and tagged the, like, his friend, but, like... And it doesn't carry over. Yeah. Uh, we decided to try RTDH for a quick... So he's already too lazy to write <laughs> the fucking name in the restaurant. When we walked in, we were taken back by how small it is, and we were annoyed by the banter of three workers standing behind the counter, having an animated, loud discussion in their language. So you're a racist. <laughs> Just right off the bat, you're not even going to hide. You're not even going to tip it in there. Like, you could have picked almost any other wording there to yeah. not come off as the most just racist bag of horse testicles. <laughs> Again, what do you want from it's a Chinese restaurant with Chinese workers speaking Chinese and you're mad about that? You're an- He literally said he's annoyed by them having a discussion in their language. Fuck you, dick. You're a piece of shit. Yeah. He goes into, like, vivid, vivid-ass detail about, like, the just ludicrous amount of food that they ordered. Uh, we wanted to try the soup dumplings first and also got Shumai as second Appy. I hate this guy. Fucking hate him. Who, wh- when did Appy become a thing? I don't know. Is that a Yelp thing for Yelp idiots? Well, dot, 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 the soup dumplings and Shumai came stacked in bamboo steamers and placed on the table. What does that have to do with anything? That's how they serve them. I think he's just writing a narrative. Yeah, as if like, anyone needs to know the yeah. fucking, like... The most, like, just intricate details of your lunch. Nobody needs to know that. Soup dumplings were not good. The shumai was better, but we will let it go at that. Bon got shrimp and lobster. Once again, nobody knows who <laughs> Bon is. Bon got shrimp and lobster sauce. A joke! Came in a soup bowl with rice and was thin in water with no lobster sauce. Consistent in your taste. Meh. You use, so you're Yelp elite and you're using meh, unironically? <laughs> The mains on the menu are very expensive for a place like this, averaging fifteen dollars. My cumin lamb was seventeen ninety five. You don't get to decide that. Like, yeah. you don't like if you think it's expensive. You're a fucking. You know the, the market prices of lamb. Yeah, of lamb and fucking like lobster. Fuck off. <sighs> Way too much for this caliber of venue. To put things in perspective, we would not return to this place, even though it's one of the few dumpling houses and stuff. This guy sounds like human garbage. This guy sounds like the reason that South Park wrote an entire episode about Yelp reviewers. Yeah. Like, you've written literally hundreds of reviews, and, like, you're you're angry at them for speaking Chinese in a Chinese restaurant. You, yeah. you are a human dumpster. The fact that, like, Yelp rewards you for writing lots of reviews and shit and gives you a little badge and sells it like, Yelp. It doesn't matter. Like I said, guy can't fucking, like, write or spell correctly. Like... It's mostly a run-on sentence. Mo- yeah. like the, the, it's There's, like, every freaking sentence ends with an ellipse, which I don't know what old people have, like, what their obsession with ellipse is. Just dot, dot, dot. Like, yeah. just put one for it. But it, then I wonder if he is old, because he used meh. I feel like old people don't yeah, use old meh. old people don't know meh. I don't they think might old use people fe, call, but not meh. Yeah, they don't call things appies either. Nobody, no sane, normal, good person uses the word appy. Fuck <laughs> off. This guy, like I said, like, I just... This guy sounds like the kind of person that, like... It, like you wouldn't want to be able to just like if you sat down and had dinner with him you just get up and just stick a screwdriver in your eyeball because anything would be more pleasant than spending a fucking afternoon with this bag of mm-hmm. shit also i just to defend on like in general because a couple people complained about prices like we're the poor couple like we don't go to places where the food is too expensive and we've gone there multiple times like yes it is one of the pricier places we go to regularly but again like the fact that we go there like yeah. frequently and don't complain about the prices, like their prices aren't that bad. Guys. Here's the thing: is when we go, we say, "Oh, it's a dim sum restaurant. Great!" So we get the dim sum platters. So you get like I don't know, eight dumplings or eight kung, like kung pao yeah. buns or whatever for like like eight bucks. If even it might even be cheaper yeah, than I that. Yeah, like somewhere like six dollars. Like, yeah, so you can get like you can get like three platters for like twenty bucks tops. But I think people walk in, they expect it to be a Chinese-American restaurant where you pay like $8 and get a combo meal and you get like a thing of fried rice and chicken and broccoli yeah. and soup and an egg roll and a freaking fortune cookie for like $9 after tax. That's what they want it to be. And they don't realize. So when they walk in and they see like, oh no, fried rice is $15. What an outrage. Like we've gotten the fried rice before. It's gigantic. Yeah. It is worth $15 because it's larger than your face. But 
you know, it, it doesn't take much to be Yelp review elite, apparently. Because, like I said, this guy, you just have to write a bunch of stupid yeah. reviews and be an asshole. And you can just be a, just like absolute racist piece of shit. Yeah. And that's fine, too. That's good enough for Yelp. Yeah. Whatever. All right, peeps. With that, we're all set here. Check, please. <laughs> Oh, boy, that's it for this week's super-sized edition of Poor Couples Food Guy Deep Dish Podcast. Remember, we are, in fact, the only podcast left where you're more likely to learn about cereal than cereal killers. Search recipes, cooking tips, and other cool stuff on our website, poorcouplesfoodguide.com. And don't forget, you can always write in to us at mail at poorcouplesfoodguide.com to ask for any food advice that you may need. You can also send in any comments, feedback, criticism, hate mail, love mail, chain letters, postcards, and whatever random musing should pass your mind. Once again, that's mail at poorcouplesfoodguide.com. Or if you'd like, you can hit us up on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as well. While you're at it, try and give us some ratings and reviews on whatever platform you're using. It really helps us gain exposure, which is great while we try to help Deep Dish's audience grow. Or if you're on YouTube, please give us a like. And if you haven't, smash that subscribe button to pieces and ring the bell and all that stuff that everyone always says. Next time, we're going to be serving up an episode focused solely around a single type of drink. This seasonal favorite was invented in the early 2000s, but its origins go way further back than you would think, thanks to its ingredients being a variety of rustic, long-cherished spices. Think you know what it is? Guess in the comments, and if you get it right, we'll give you a great big shout-out in a future episode. Until then, we bid you a good day, and we give you good eats, so stay hungry and keep feeding that brain. And tummy! It sucks being, like, in your 30s. Be like, I need my inhaler. <laughs> Fucking getting old, man. <laughs>